What's going on everyone, it's Justin here, and today I've got a video talking about one of my most asked questions over on Instagram DMs, and that is how to make money online as a teenager. So for those who don't know, I've been making YouTube videos for about 10 years now. I'm 23 at the moment, but I started making videos at around the age of 12 to 13, I would say, and one of the things that I was really trying to do at the time was to just find any way to make money to reinvest back into what I didn't know was a business at a time but was something that I enjoyed doing and that was YouTube videos. Um, I started making videos on an iPod Touch, couldn't really afford a camera, um, and eventually saved up to a camera and over the years added more equipment and built it into a media company today and what we're sitting in right now is an office that is just for making videos over 10 years later. So over those years I definitely tried a lot of things, some of which worked better than others, and I'm going to like share those tips and what I found is the most efficient, but also talk about the things that are important to learn at a young age and try versus just prioritizing making money. Because in the long run, if you're able to attain certain skills and apply them effectively, that is going to lead to the best outcome as you reach your 20s and 30s. This video is sponsored by MSI and the Prestige 14 computer that is part of the Intel Evo certification, which from our testing has done a very good job in both efficiency, power, battery life, and also security. And so today we're gonna talk about some of the important features of this computer and how it can really contribute to productivity and business for anyone who is looking to start something online um, in the creative field or also for school. And this is an option that lasts you many years to come. It is super slim and portable, very well put together, and has enough power at a very good price point for what it's offered. So we're gonna talk about some of the features of this, and if you guys would like to check it out, I'm gonna drop a link down below. So before we talk about some of the things that I tried that may have worked or may have failed, I think the most important thing is as a teenager, you can try things as many times as you want. And for the most part, the consequences are gonna be much smaller than when you try something new a little bit later on. So. When I was like 12 or 13, I wanted to be an architect. I was like playing hockey. I also maybe thought that YouTube could be a career of making videos online. But honestly, in 2010, 2011, YouTube world was not really something that was a full-time job for a lot of people. Um, obviously some of the large creators were doing it full-time, but I really did think that it was just a hobby that I could make a few bucks on while I was in middle and high school. So I think the main message in that is to seek opportunity, try new skills, figure out what you're good at, and also decide which skills you want to turn into a career and which ones you want to keep as a hobby. So for me, YouTube was one that I wanted to kind of develop into a full-time company, but knew it was so distant. Um, playing hockey was obviously a passion. And right now I feel like a lot of these skills that I learned as a teenager and may have had an interest in, including architecture, have sort of come in full circle and we've tried to blend it into what it is right now. So if you guys see on my channel, I review technology the same way I did back when I was a kid, but we also started doing more like interior design or real estate and stuff. And for a while, that wasn't really part of my career path, but look Looking back at my childhood, I remember I loved to draw, I loved to design things, and also visualize um, projects. So the Makeover series kind of roots from that. So the first venture that I kind of tried online was before my YouTube days, and I was probably around 11 or 12 at the time, and I continued to do it as I was starting YouTube, and that was selling things on local classifieds. So whether it was Craigslist, and nowadays Facebook Marketplace is like the most powerful platform for that, I was trying to find stuff around the house that my parents may have wanted to sell, and I would go ahead and take photos, list it, work with a customer, set up meeting times, negotiate the price, and my parents would give me a 10% sent a commission on the product that I was selling. So I was making like $5 here and there, like $4, sometimes 10 to 20 if I was lucky. But selling stuff locally, I believe, has contributed the most to my abilities of selling stuff online, brand deals, negotiating with large companies, um, because the whole process of working with a customer, being firm on negotiations, but also knowing where to be flexible, and also presenting a pitch, and all that stuff came from selling stuff on local classifieds like Craigslist. So the first thing we're gonna talk about of the MSI Prestige 14 computer is the power. And this one right here has an i7 processor. It is the 11th generation and it's 20% more powerful than the previous generation. 
Some of the things that you can expect out of the EVO platform, both with the CPU and general computer performance, includes improvements in the Iris X integrated graphics that give you three times faster photo and video editing. On the aspect of Wi-Fi, it is also Wi-Fi 6 supported, which is great, and a lot of the phones nowadays are integrating that feature. And there's also more freedom with nine plus hours of battery life on full HD displays. One of the most notable features, in my opinion, though, is the instant wake. So as soon as you want to like flip open the computer and start using it right away, it takes less than a second to respond. It also has really fast storage with the PCIe 4 support, and it's over 7.8 gigabytes per second in terms of its fastest read speed. So when it comes to video editing, it is a combination of your CPU, your GPU, and also your storage. And this computer has a good combination for administrative work, for students, and also for video editing and photo editing because it has good built-in graphics, a super powerful processor, and super fast storage, which honestly, when you're using an expensive computer, a lot of times if your cable is messed up or your storage is not fast enough, all of the other things about the computer just goes out the window. So PCIe 4 is something that you only find on some computers. And when it came to video editing on the Prestige 14, it was super fast. I was able to use Premiere Pro. I also like to use DaVinci Resolve. If you're editing 1080p, which when you're starting out on video, a lot of times you're probably gonna be working in 1080p, it is gonna be totally fine. You can do your color grading and exporting and all that. And you can also do a little bit of 4K and I found it to be very usable. So that is all great to see when it comes to power and when it comes to photo editing as well, having fast storage and storing your images and the raw files is also going to be very useful. The display is also super nice. It is full HD with a full 100% sRGB coverage, which is gonna be important for anyone who plans to video and photo edit on the computer directly. The bezels are also really thin, which I like, so it's pretty much a computer that is the same form factor as a 13 inch model, but in a 14 inch screen. So it's really maximizing all that space up front. Aside from the PCIe support for faster SSD internally, it also has all the ports that are needed. So you have Thunderbolt 4, which is the latest standard, super fast, so you can plug in any sort of storage for expandability. You have two of these ports on this side, and you also have a regular USB and a micro SD card slot. So that is nice to see. The only thing that I would say is kind of missing is a dedicated HDMI port, because being able to plug this computer into a monitor would be really nice. If you have a Thunderbolt monitor, it still can connect directly to the computer, but the main purpose here and the priority of MSI's design is for portability on the go for business users. As someone who loves to type, this computer also has a nice five degree hinge, which makes it very comfortable as it kind of slightly raises it up at the backside. And the key travel is one and a half millimeters, which is plenty. And I just felt like it had a nice soft touch feel to it. And that is a thing that I also noticed, as I mentioned in the other MSI computer. If you're planning to use a computer for school as well though, another very important feature that is part of like the Evo characteristics is great battery life. So this computer has a claim battery life of 12 hours on optimal settings. And from my usage, I was able to get about seven to eight hours. And honestly, seven to eight hours is really, really good for a laptop. And if you're doing a combination of like creative work and also web browsing, then that is an entire day of usage. The other Evo characteristic is the fast charge. And in just 15 minutes of charge, this will get you one and a half hours of usage. And it does charge through USB type C. The next biggest thing is obviously creating a YouTube channel. And I know a lot of times people might see my videos nowadays and ask like, oh, that doesn't really look like a job or how did that happen? But in reality, I think what a lot of people don't know is that it took over 10 years and the first five years, I really wasn't making that much at all. Um, I may have got a little bit lucky by joining YouTube at the perfect time of around 2010, 2011. And by the time 2014 and 2015 rolled around, companies were starting to put a lot into influencer marketing and that has just doubled and multiplied even beyond that every single year since um, in what could become a full-time company. But by starting YouTube at the age of like 11 to 12 when I was still in middle school, living in my parents' house, I was able to create as many videos as I wanted without having any risks. There was no time risk because aside from school, I was playing hockey and had like a pretty open schedule. But I think what was important is that I found something that I liked and I committed every single second into making YouTube videos. As soon as I came back from school, I'd film a video. Um, on weekends, I would film video. I'd be editing while like friends were hanging out and pretty much every single thing throughout those years was was committed to making YouTube videos and growing the following. But as I mentioned, my first year on Google AdSense, I pretty much only made like a dollar. Uh, I spent 
all my money that I was making on a camera and an iPod and my parents were pissed and thought I was like wasting it. Uh, they thought YouTube was just like a little short hobby, but eventually over the years, we grew to 100,000 subscribers. From then we started doing brand deals and honestly, the first year of doing brand deals, I kind of filled the channel. The sub gain was really slow, my views are really bad, and it took like a whole restructuring process of how I approach content in order to come back, and I'm happy to say that the years after that have been much better. With making YouTube videos, there's the creative side and also the business side. And one of the most commonly asked questions as an extension of how to make money online is how do I start getting products as a small creator? Back then, I would go and buy magazines at a shop and inside these magazines, they're always just like full of ads of different companies of like iPhone cases, iPod cases. And I would just look through and contact every single company on that page. And like every Sunday, I would make it a thing to email a hundred companies and ask for product. And I would tell them I'm a 12 year old kid reviewing products online would you guys like to send me something to make a video on my youtube channel and i would say out of the hundred in the very beginning when i was like at a thousand subscribers or so i would probably get like five responses and keep in mind these products are worth like 20 bucks nothing more than that so i'd make a video and i would even sometimes have like bins of products and just review them one by one and in one week can i be able to knock out like 10 to 15 quick videos with no editing at all so after that i would sell the products and i'd be able to make 10 20 dollars and i was like well, it's kind of cool to be able to make money off products that I didn't have to pay for. And so that was kind of how I kept the YouTube business going and saved up for better equipment. So I would say, put together a good pitch, create content for free at first and show what you're capable of and then email as many companies as possible. Um, the cold calling process is really going to teach you a lot. With making YouTube videos though, having a good computer is somewhat important. And we talked about some of the power capabilities of the MSI unit. And in my opinion, the best software to learn at a young age is the Adobe Suite. I personally came from like iMovie and Final Cut Pro 10, and I still use Final Cut to this day. But to be totally honest with you, the Adobe platform is much more versatile. And a lot of times, if you wanna go into like film production or the video world specifically, they're gonna want you to know how to use Adobe. And that is an area that I really lack in. So going with a Windows computer is often a good idea because the Adobe Suite is available on Mac and Windows. So this computer is one that is totally capable of editing 1080p and some 4K. It was able to run relatively smooth. And I think for anyone who's looking for their first computer, you can kind of go two directions. You can spend money on one that will last you a couple years, but may not be as powerful, or you can invest in one that can last a few more years and can sell for a decent price after you're done using it. And it'll allow you to do more things such as video editing um, without the technical limitations of a computer that may not be able to support that. And my first computer was 200 bucks. It didn't really work that well wasn't able to install any software or edit videos. And if it wasn't for investing in a nicer computer a few years down, I may not even know how to video edit today. Uh, because when I first started on YouTube, I didn't have any editing machines, so I would just upload the videos after recording it in one take. In terms of finding tutorials on how to edit videos, I think YouTube is the most powerful platform for tutorials, and that is because it is completely free. There's a lot of good courses out there, but they cost like hundreds of dollars and sometimes even thousands, and I don't really think that's necessary. You can learn all the basics from like watching YouTube videos, but the most important thing is to actually do it. Record some random videos on your phone because phone cameras are really good nowadays. Put it on your computer, try to edit it into something, and don't use gear as your excuse in the beginning. Once you have built up skills for video editing though, you can either start making your own videos or films and upload them to like YouTube or Instagram, but another platform could also be using Fiverr. So you can put your video work on there and people can hire you to edit videos and edit photos, and that will allow you to practice your creative skills, but also your business skills while making a good hourly rate off that. Fiverr is a platform that I personally used um, to outsource work all the time, and I think it's actually been a really good platform because it does have some accountability based on ratings. So if you do a good job, somebody will leave you a five-star rating and from there you'll get more customers, build your skills while you try to do something like YouTube that may not make a lot of money in the first few years of trying it. On another topic of creative though, if you really like taking photos, then selling presets is also a great way to make money online nowadays. The best thing about digital assets is that the costs are very low and the margins are extremely high. If you're able to take some great photos and edit some great photos, then you can also create content on YouTube on tutorials of how to do good photography. And you could sell a course if you're really, really good at photography, but also just by selling presets, if your video does get quite a few views or goes semi-viral, 
viral, then all of a sudden you could make thousands of dollars just off a digital asset that you may have made in five minutes on your computer using Lightroom. With the side hustles that I'm talking about, having a combination of administrative work and just like web-based stuff that may not need that much power, paired with like photo and video editing that definitely requires quite a bit, one of the most important things is gonna be the portability and battery life. So this computer I feel like is a really good size and a blend of power and portability. As you can see, it is just super thin, but at the same time has great battery life and the latest processors for power. The total weight is under three pounds and just 0.63 inches in thickness. And I just really like the way that the hinge feels nice and durable. It's easy to fold. I can also carry it around. It's very comfortable on the lap. And it also has a military grade durability, which is great to see. It's got a bit of a metal finish to it. And in terms of the keyboard, it really does maximize the amount of space. Um, you can see it pretty much goes edge to edge. And I also like that the trackpad is extra large. So if you don't have a mouse with you and you wanna do some video editing, there's nothing worse than having like a tiny little trackpad to try to click through an entire timeline. So I think this computer really does make a good use of the space. The keys are also all illuminated. We also did a video of another MSI computer late last year and that was really good. There's also a fingerprint sensor that works very well and it's nice that they have it, but I would have liked if it wasn't in the trackpad because it just seems to sort of get in the way. But the trackpad is larger than usual, so it isn't really a huge issue. The Intel Iris Xe graphics that are built into the 11th generation processor provides great rendering power and it's like a discrete GPU in a computer of this size because obviously once you get to like the dedicated GPUs from Nvidia and stuff, then the computer is going to be much larger and heavier and also very power consuming. So at the end of the day, now that I've talked about all the things that I tried to do to make money as a teenager and heading into high school and university before YouTube really took over as a full-time company, and even nowadays I try to find little projects here and there, um, this computer is one that is really able to suit the needs for many years. So say you picked it up now, you could probably use it for quite a few years because it's got all the latest and greatest specs for today. The fastest storage, it has Thunderbolt 4 with 40 gigabit capability. There's a great screen, great keyboard, and just enough power at a price point that doesn't break the bank. It's under 1200 bucks, so I feel like that is not like cheap, but for the power that you're getting and wanting to do creative work, I feel like it's the perfect medium of all things. The hardware is great, it is super portable, the battery life is there, and I overall just had a really good experience and I can really recommend to anyone looking for a Windows computer right now. For those who may not need all the power that this computer is able to offer in the i7 variant and may want to save a little bit of money, you can also go ahead and get the i5 EVO model, which for anyone who's doing like business work or just general administrative on like web browsing and basic applications, that one is going to have more than enough power for your everyday needs and still has all the great features that the EVO platform offers that you can find on the MSI Prestige line. Since its release, I've tested out three EVO computers, and I think what's great about the Intel EVO platform is that it's getting you a standard of performance and efficiency that are expected of these computers with the certification at an attainable price for a lot of people. So they have different ranges. They have the i5 models, and of course the i7 right here, but if you wanna do like video editing or photo editing, then I definitely recommend spending around $1,000 and up, or just around the entry level of $1,000 to have a computer that is able to last for many years to come and hopefully propel your career. Going back to like the Facebook and online classifieds that we talked about in the beginning though, another thing that I also did one summer was fix iPhones. So this is a case of figuring out what is missing in the place that you live and trying to provide something that makes a lot of sense. So where I live, it's Victoria, BC, there is no Apple store. So there's nowhere that somewhere can just like go to the Genius Bar and get their phone fixed. They either gotta mail it in or they have to take it over to Vancouver. And to get your phone replaced in Victoria, you have to go to like a third party in some cases and it was usually like hundreds of dollars just to get a screen fix so the iphone 5 and 5s which was like kind of the phone at the time was super easy to repair and so i decided to buy some parts it was usually like 30 dollars and instead of repairing phones for people where there would be a little bit of liability i put an ad on craigslist that said i was buying phones and i would usually pay like 80 dollars for the phone um, and i would own it and 
In most cases, I would pay about $80 for the phone, which is like the market price of a cracked screen at the time. I would pay $30 for a screen and I had a supplier that was based in Canada that could express a screen over for $10 overnight. So I didn't have to like stock up on a lot of parts and spend a lot of money. And from there, I would fix the phone after repairing it. So my total cost was $110 and I would sell it like literally hours later for $250 or $260. And just like that, I was able to make like $4,000 in a month during the summer and back then I would just pretty much spend the money as soon as it came in. Moving on though, I would say the longest lasting side hustle that went on throughout the entire high school years was selling stuff in school actually. I noticed a lot of people had iPhone 4 and 4S's and I personally didn't. Um, my parents got me like a little flip phone. Uh, and so I noticed everybody had these iPhone 4 and 4S's and you might remember back then, you can just like take out one screw on the bottom or two screws and replace the back. So I went on eBay and I noticed that they were selling backs in all different colors. So you had like a orange, green, blue, red, um, brown, like all these crazy colors of iPhone backs. So I would order those iPhone backs in sets of 10 and I also buy uh, bumper cases. And during recess, I would just like go around and ask every single person and bug them multiple times a week to buy something off me, whether it was like an iPhone case or an iPhone back. And I remember at the time I was paying like 25 cents for the iPhone bumpers and I was selling them for $20. And in the first week, I think I made like $400 during lunchtime. Uh, second week, we moved on to screen protectors. We offered like clear and anti-glare that made another $400. And eventually we tried to open a Shopify site online and I lost all the money trying to start a website and our only sale ended up costing more to ship than we actually made off the actual sale. That was sort of like an example of like experimenting with things, trying to go bigger and end up failing. Um, but localizing your business to start is probably the best way to make quick cash. And as you sell out of one product and everyone has one and they're happy with it, you move on to the next product. So I was selling iPhone backs, bumpers, and screen protectors to the same people. And by then, some people were spending like $100 in high school using their parents' money, um, buying the stuff that I would pretty much order from China on eBay. Another thing that I also did in my late teens was write blog posts. And there's multiple ways to monetize a blog post, whether you're writing for somebody else and also posting it over to Medium. And I think Shelby Church has a video on how much money she was able to make off of some blog posts on a topic that she enjoys. But the way that I made money off blog posts was more on the hourly basis. And it was for the Best Buy Canada blog. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, I tried to work for Best Buy and Feature Shop and didn't get hired. But the way I did it was I had a buddy who was also pretty young um, he was writing for them and he mentioned to me that he was writing articles in French. So I was like, maybe I could do ones in English and I also have my YouTube experience and product review experience. So I essentially wrote a couple test articles and the, the main editor reviewed them, said they were good. And from there, they were paying uh, probably like $100 per article and I was able to knock them out in like 30 minutes to an hour. So on an hourly basis, while I was in class, I would just be like typing away, pretending I was doing notes, but I was actually just transcribing videos from notes of my own videos, using the photos and video frames from that and generating a couple thousand dollars at the very most on the side each month because my main focus on time was still YouTube. These are just the ways that I tried to make money as a teenager in high school and my whole focus this entire time was YouTube because I saw a lot of potential in the platform. It was something that I liked doing and I never thought that I would hit like 20,000, 50,000 or 100,000 subscriber. So when I was in high school, I was just like really focused on increasing that subscriber count and just pushing the limits beyond what I thought I would be able to to reach in my entire time on that platform. So obviously like when you look at the whole trajectory of starting out at the age of 12 or 13, the timing of things were really good. Um, I started YouTube when it was still a relatively new platform and nowadays, honestly speaking, it would be very, very hard to start from the beginning all over again. But I would say the more saturated the platform is and the more opportunity there is, the easier it is in a way because there's so many people watching YouTube videos nowadays and wherever there is opportunity, it's going to be more competitive. So if you're asking um, whether I had a huge advantage starting YouTube in 2010, yes, I might've, but the opportunities nowadays and the ways that people were able to get creative and the number of platforms available, um, I mean, Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff wasn't even around when I started YouTube. Um, I think it's important to find your platform and build off of that. I might be a little bit biased, but I would say Instagram and YouTube are the platforms that have the most longevity from a career perspective. Um, TikTok can make you a lot of quick money if you're good at it, but 
Yeah, I would say find your platform and I might even be out of date because I'm in my 20s now, but Nowadays, uh, there's like drop shipping. I know a lot of people are doing that. There's a lot of ways to resell, but I think at the core, the ways that I kind of did side ventures back when I was in middle and high school are still relatively applicable to a degree nowadays, except it is far more online and e-commerce has gone crazy. So. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know a lot of you guys want to see more business and lifestyle. Um, if you want to see me do more of it, let me know. And I hope I don't like ramble as much in the future ones, but I'll see you guys in the next video.